in the Channel Islands, one of the first guidebooks of Jersey, published in 1834, the author, Henry Inglis, describes Roselle as one of, if not the sweetest bays of Jersey. In Philippe Dumeresque's 1685 survey of the island, he describes the area as a small creek called Roselle, where the islanders keep several boats, both for fishing and for going to the Ecrahoes, there to fetch such seaweed as they burn and manure their land with. The bay is divided between the parishes of St. Martin and Trinity, and is a beautiful part of the island enjoyed by locals and tourists. The development of Dumeresque's small creek in the following 200 years was influenced by the fortification of Jersey during the French Wars and the rise of the oyster fishing industry. Defence and then trade were therefore at the heart of growth of Roselle. In 1739, the states of Jersey discussed the construction of a small boulevard at Roselle Harbour. They agreed that the boulevard should be large enough for two cannons and its construction was part of a larger scheme of fortifications taking place at Bouley Bay. By 1741, the states were looking for money to find the construction and raised a levy on the rates to build the two boulevards. There is evidence that the work had started on the boulevard by 1745 when Aaron Gavey, one of the entrepreneurs for the erection of the boulevard at Roselle, is referred to in the States of Jersey Minutes. The states signed off the work as finished in 1748. Located on the top of Trinity side of the bay is Fort Le Conve on Ne de Grey Fort. A watch house is shown on the location of the fort as early as 1679 or 80, when it is mentioned in the Captain Legg's survey of the defences. In 1742, it was brought to the attention of the states that the guardhouse at Roselle, situated on a hill called Le Consnoe, which is, was in a ruined state. It was ordered that the guardhouse and the magazine should be real at the foot of the hill near the boulevard proposed in 1739. In November 1834, land was purchased at Nedigway from Charles Vaudin, and in 1836, the fort was extended to hold 50 men, a magazine for 90 barrels of powder, and five heavy guns. The fort is shown here in the 1870s in a survey of the island that was taken by the Royal Engineers. The fort was purchased by the Crown by Tom Hamilton Cockburn Mercer in 1922 and became a private residence. Roselle Fort ceased to become a private residence in the occupation period and it was fortified once again, this time by the German authorities. The fort could house four sergeants and 21 men and significant firepower. Roselle Harbour was also fortified with a concrete bunker at the end of the pier and a tank turret located halfway up the pier. During the 18th and early 19th century, it was the defence of the island from the French which drove construction projects at Roselle. After the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, it became trade and the rise of the oyster fishing industry that continued the development of the harbour. The industry's main port was Goree, but the Roselle fishermen saw the development of the harbour as their opportunity to become part of this lucrative trade. By 1834, between 200 and 300 oyster boats were operating from Jersey. The boats employed around 2,000 crew, and the industry also created jobs for around 1,000 women and boys. In 1820, the states of Jersey discussed a petition with the inhabitants of Trinity and St. Martin. Attempts had been made for many years to give the boats at Horizon Harbour more shelter. These had mainly involved the build-up of rocks in the harbour to act as shelter for the boats. The inhabitants of Roselle pointed out that currently only six to eight boats could be moored in the harbour. They proposed that, with more money to construct a better refuge, 30 oyster boats could be accommodated. By 1826, the people of Roselle were asking for a refuge to shelter 40 oyster boats. In 1829, the Harbours Committee recommended that a pier should be built and that work should start as soon as possible. They recommended a sum of £2,000 be put aside for the works. In 1831, development of the role of a harbour continued when Roselle Harbour was given the same rights relating to the disembarkation of beef at St Helier, St Oban and Goree. By 1845, the states were purchasing land to enlarge the harbour. In July of that year, it was agreed that the port needed its own harbour master and George Knoll was appointed to the post. The harbour master's account for Roselle from 1849 showed that 90 vessels paying harbour dues arrived in the port during that year. Vessels that came into the harbour a number of times included the Esperance and the Phoenix. Between them, these two vessels made up over half the trips into the harbour through the year. The close relationship between the people of Roselle and sea sometimes had potentially dangerous consequences. Those living at Roselle were witness to shipwrecks and, as the following two stories show, were often involved in rescuing or giving shelter to stricken crew. In 1816, a French transport ship, the Balance, sailing from St. Malo to Canada, struck the Duroir, a reef to the rest of the Ecrahoes, and 40 people were drowned. The 70 survivors were temporarily housed in the barracks where the men of 8th Royal Battalion 
supplied them with food, beds and clothes. A receipt from the Jersey Archive shows some of the locals actually profited from the wreck. In May 1816, Elie de Grouchy was charged with four leave, two sous, for rope from the wreck of the Balance by J. De Holm. Shipwrecks around the Jersey coast led the states of Jersey to vote that £150 should be granted for one lifeboat with a cart, boathouse and equipment. The boat was built by Roselle by Mr Lillington, an English shipwright from Weymouth under guidance of Captain Simmons and apparently tested for seaworthiness by 24 men who tried and failed to sink her. The lifeboat was launched at Roselle on 17th of May 1830. Sir John Lacouta was present at the launch and wrote in his diary, I hope she may soon save one life when she even then will have repaid her expense. Sir John was the man who drove forward the lifeboat project after the wreck of the fanny in which Lord Harley and a number of passengers died. Sir John took the suggestion of a lifeboat to the States and was charged with looking at the project. Whether the lifeboat did ever save a life is uncertain, but the inhabitants of Roselle certainly helped save 18 crew in November 1872 when the Norwegian vessel Isabella Northcott went aground on the Ekrahose. Her distress signals were noticed from the shore, and despite the stormy conditions, Charles Blampier, a Roselle farmer, set out his boat, the Mayflower, with Ellie Whitley and John Bouchard to rescue the crew. Blampierre and his companions reached the stricken vessel, landing 12 of the crew on the Ekrahos. They then rowed six other crew members back to shore before returning for the other 12 the next day. The RNLI presented all three rescuers with medals for bravery and five pounds each. Mr. Blampier was also given a Norwegian silver life-saving medal. By the 19th century, Jersey was becoming a tourist destination and Roselle ga began to be influenced by the rise in this industry. The Roselle Bay Hotel, now the Roselle Inn, was originally a private house belonging to George Philippe Noel. Noel sold the property to Joshua Blompiard in 1851. Blompiard was described as the captain of a smack in the 1861 census. It was his son, Joshua Jr., who decided not to follow his father to sea, but to open the house as a hotel. In the 1871 census, the property appears as a hotel for the first time, with J. Blompiard Jr. listed as the head of the household, living with his wife, Bridget, and one groom, Frederick Le Hucke, as a servant. Blompier sold the hotel on to John de Grouchy in 1878, who very quickly sold the property on to Francis Edward Hine in 1879. Hine was a wine and spirit merchant who lived in Roseville Terrace in St. Helier and brought the property as an investment. Subsequent records show a number of different landlords in place at Roselle. It was Hine, however, who built a wooden pavilion in front of the hotel. In 1891, the honorary police register from St. Martin recorded a dramatic incident at the Roselle Bay Hotel. On the 19th of February, Edwin Jones and Owen McGovern, both 18-year-olds from Liverpool, were arrested. Both men were soldiers stationed at Roselle Barracks and were part of the 1st South Lancashire Regiment. The pair were accused of stealing nine bottles of spirits, seven bottles of wine, five boxes of figs and a corkscrew from the house of Walter Thomas Lecoq at Roselle. On the same night, they crept into the stables of Roselle Bay Hotel and killed a goat and two chickens. The newspaper report covering the court proceedings states... The accused admitted to killing the goat, but they said they were drunk at the time. They were sent to court on the 21st of February 1891, and each were given six months in prison. The principal hotel in Roselle today is the Chateau Le Cher. Le Cher was originally a private house constructed on land bought by Harriet Fothergill, near Curtis, in 1841 and 1844. It was Harriet's father, Samuel Curtis, who was famous for planting the beautiful array of plants at Le Cher, which had been described as probably the greatest diversity of subtropical plants of any British garden before or since. Samuel was born in 1779 and published a number of botanical books during his lifetime. He became editor and proprietor of the Botanical Magazine in 1827. He spent much of the 1830s looking for the perfect climate and conditions to develop a tropical garden in Great Britain, and he found these at La Cher. Samuel died in 1860 and is buried in St. Martin's Churchyard. After our father's death, Harriet continued to live at the share. When Harriet died in 1888, her will records a bequest of a set of the Curtis Botanical Magazine to Henry Curtis. The house passed out of the Curtis family in 1898, when it was purchased by Charles Arthur Fletcher. Charles was responsible for demolishing the original Le Cher and rebuilding the house. In 1921, Elizabeth Grant Ross bought Le Cher from Charles's son, Elizabeth must have owned significant property in the area, as a few years later in 1924, she purchased Roselle Barracks from the Crown. The walls of the barracks can still be seen as one of the main features of Roselle Bay. They are currently being developed, but were previously part of the Beau Couperon Hotel. 
The barracks were built as part of the fortification of the island by Lieutenant General George Don, Lieutenant Governor of Jersey during the Napoleonic Wars. The land on which the barracks still stand was leased by Samuel Lomprier, Master of the Barracks of the Crown from Philippe Raoul Lomprier, the Seigneur of Roselle in October 1810. The lease was originally for a term of 99 years at an annual cost of £4.13. and shillings. Construction of the barracks must have begun straight away, as the archive holds a letter from Don Edward de la Tasse dated 2nd of May 1811, giving him authority to place four men at the new barracks at Roselle Harbour. Despite the peace that descended on Europe at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the barracks continued to be used by the military with army pensioners listed living at the barracks in the 1871 and 1881 centres. In 1932, the barracks were sold to Arthur Villeneuve Nicole, who in turn sold the property to Charles Frederick Sharp in 1958. It must have been Charles who turned the barracks into a hotel, as in 1966 he sold a hotel called Le Coupron de Roselle, previously Roselle Barracks, to Roselle Hotels Limited.